Thank you. So I'd like to welcome you all uh, to this meeting this morning. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we all meet across the, the globe today and pay my respects to our elders past, present and emerging. Uh, so welcome everyone. Um, we'll kick off with our, our first speaker today, who is uh, Ms. Mai Alakan, uh, who is the manager, ACR manager, um, Pacific and PNG. Uh, thank you very much, Mai. And now I am sharing my screen. Can everyone see my screen? I'll now try. Yes. <laughs> yes, we can see a screen. Right? Okay, thank you. All right, thanks, Over Linda. To you, Mai. Thank you. Good morning to everyone, and thanks for making time um, to join us in this showcase. A special thanks as well to ACR project leaders uh, that are joining us this morning as well to talk more about their projects and how this links to opportunities for our potential applicants for the PASC CR program. Just a few slides on, you know why agriculture is important. As you know, agriculture is the biggest lever that we can pull to achieving development goals. Just Linda, if you can just go on and click some of these slides. And um, as you know, um, as everybody knows and, and, and has experienced that investing in agriculture is the most effective way of addressing poverty. Next slide, please. Um, as you know, the future isn't what it used to be. Um, and this was something that uh, our former general manager for country partnerships noted in 2019. And the realities that we had in 2019 have severely and utterly changed to what it is now. But the challenges still remain for agriculture. We have to produce more and better quality for less, from less land, less energy, and uh, water for more sustainable, sustainably and equitably. But you know, we, the call to action is still there that we need to collectively act now. Next slide, please. But we all know that agriculture science has much to offer in achieving this gain, gains in agriculture and improving markets and is the most, if not the most effective way to lift people out of poverty, um, as well as reduce hunger and malnutrition, not only globally, but more so in the Pacific. So ACR in the Pacific, um, our, our mandate more broadly in ACR is to broker and invest research partnerships with our partner countries in the region to build knowledge to support crucial development objectives um, such as um, food security and reducing poverty, enhancing resilience to climate and disaster risk, building healthier food systems, improving equity and empowerment, especially for women and girls, fostering opportunities to be linked to value chains, and of course, building research capacities in agriculture, forestry, and, and the fisheries. Next slide, please. Um, in the Pacific, we work in eight countries, Fiji, Kiribati, Samoa, Solomon Islands, Tonga, Tuvalu, Vanuatu, and then also Papua New Guinea, where we have a country office. And ACR delivers our partnerships through bilateral and regional projects, both in research and capacity building. Next slide, please. Um, the Pacific Research Program to date, uh, we have 52 projects across nine research programs, particularly agribusiness, climate change, horticulture, fisheries, forestry, soil and land management, livestock, social science, and crops. It's important for our potential applicants in the room to know that these are the research areas and themes that would be important for you to think of as you develop your research proposal under the scholarship. Next slide, please. And But it is more important to underline how projects are designed and developed in the ACR. Pro, in ACR. Um, this has to, any ACR project or initiative must align with the national and regional priorities of our partner countries in the Pacific. Of course, it has to complement as well the research priorities of ACR in the region, um, supplementing research investments in the region and ensuring that we complement, but also offer value add to what is being done or research initiatives that are already in place um, in the Pacific or in your respective countries. Um, mindful that there are other development partners working in agriculture and fisheries and forestry space, but because also ACR is 
is part of the overall development assistance of Australia. Um, and we must also ensure that any of our research work are aligning and supporting and contributing to the objectives of the Australian aid program. What I would also like to highlight as well is that in the design and implementation of all research partnerships of ACR in the region, it is always guided by the principle that it has to be shared the objectives has to be shared and creates mutual benefits for all partners from research, science, and innovation in the sector. And I would encourage our, our applicants and, and potential scholars to think of this as you develop and design your research proposal as part of your application to the PASS ER program. Next slide, please. Um, so as I noted, um, of course, we are all here to learn more about how you can um, uh, go on in your application process. The ACR Pacific Agriculture Scholarship and Support and Climate Resilience Program, it is indeed a mouthful, PASCR, <laughs> as you know, is a postgraduate scholarship and academic support for students in the agriculture and forestry sector. It is a scholarship for Pacific Islanders to study in the Pacific. So universities, universities such as USP and Fiji National University will be your host academic institution. The key feature of the program, and that's why we have this showcase today, is for students and potential applicants to research agriculture problems within the context that the solution needs to work. So it has to work within the context of your country, more particularly as it connects to an ongoing ACR research project, but also opportunities for you to build professional networks, uh, which, will be which will be relevant to your post-study. So I would encourage you to look in inside the room and see who the project leaders are, because beyond um, your application, this can be an opportunity for you to connect with an expert that's working in aquaculture, someone who's connecting in aquaculture in Tonga, Fiji, and Samoa, or someone who is working on extension and family farm teams, because I know Deborah is here as well. Um, so there's a range of experts that are working across the Pacific and whom you might connect as well. Um, post your study if you're indeed successful or in your current work um, if you are indeed working in research. So I would encourage you to think about as you listen to the next hour or so to see where research opportunities are insofar as your proposal that could focus on enhancing food productivity and production, soil health, natural resource management, improving biosecurity or addressing biosecurity issues, um, improving market links and access for rural communities and farmers and fisher folks. Research that also considers or if not addresses gender equity and women empowerment. One health, food systems and nutrition, climate resilience and improving improving delivery of agriculture extension services. So in the next hour or so, you'll have presentations coming from ACR research project partners and project leaders on how and what are the opportunities and research topics that you might think of as part of your proposal. With that, I wish everyone a good day and a productive conversation today and looking forward uh, to what's coming next. Uh, over to you, Linda. Thank you very much, Mai, for that lovely warm welcome and introduction to uh, ACR uh, more broadly and in the Pacific. Uh, I'll now uh, move over to our first uh, project leader presentation, and that is from um, Associate Professor Doran Gupta from the School of Agriculture, Food and Ecosystem Science at the University of Melbourne. Uh, over to you. I'll show you a pre presentation now. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, it's my pleasure to be here today morning and um, a very good morning to all of you and good afternoon from different parts of the world we're sitting right now. Um, before I start, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land um, on today, Yota Yota, and acknowledge that um, Indigenous Australians has been the custodians of the lands for thousands of years, and I pay my respect to their past, present and emerging elders. Um, sorry. Uh, 
uh, I'm the project leader for uh, for our new project, which has just started this year, um, entitled Sustainable Agriculture Intensification Systems for Climate Resilient Development in Pacific Island Countries. And uh, I work with Faculty of Science uh, with the University of Melbourne and based at Dukey Campus, which is one of the regional campus in Victoria. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so um, the partner organizations we are working in Pacific, um, that's USP, um, primarily Samoa and Tonga campus. Um, in Samoa, our trial site is with USP campus, whereas uh, for Tonga, it's primarily with Modi TT um, and um, Lincoln University is another partner with us. There are researchers from Melbourne University engaged on this project as well. Next slide, please. Um, Dr. Uh, Viliami is uh, Dr. Willie, which uh, if most of you know him, he is the deputy leader on project. And uh, for Samoa, uh, we have the country coordinator, Associate Professor Sia Kadara, and uh, for Tonga, country coordinator is Dr. Ravan. And you can see the list of researchers being listed here from USP, um, Samoa and Tonga, as well as University of Melbourne and Lincoln. I've just put them together based on the uh, you know expertise we share and just wanted to highlight that from crop science, farming systems, to soil science, livestock systems, to crop protection, agribusiness and extension to climate change, crop modeling to gender specialist and um, also uh, support research members. We have a very diverse team of uh, experts and um, we you might have seen some of the projects which we have already um, highlighted, which could be part of this project. And we bring expertise as, as I have highlighted here from uh, different fields uh, of for this project, but also which will be really beneficial for potential students to understand that uh, if they want to work in one or the other area proposed uh, with our expertise. Next slide, please. Broadly, our project aims to evaluate biophysical and economical benefits of uh, multiple um, sustainable intensification practices in crop-based farming systems in Samoa and Tonga, so that uh, we can provide uh, these um, sustainable intensification practices are proven. They have demonstrated in various parts of the world the, the benefit they can bring to provide climate adaptation and mitigation benefits. Um, but also we in the in the in in while we are working at our trial sites, we also would like to assess the practicality of these uh, sustainable intensification practices from the perspective of farmers and use uh, we are you going to use all our trial sites and opportunities to engage different stakeholders and farmers to support support climate resilient development in the Pacific. Next slide, please. Um, while uh, I don't have much of time to explain, but what I want to highlight here that uh, when we look for various uh, sustainable intensification components, uh, we are targeting uh, all five listed here from conservation agriculture to looking at the soil health um, challenges and uh, possible solutions and improved um, bringing improved genetics. Uh, so as uh, efficient use of resources such as water and also looking for minimizing the use of chemicals uh, in the in different farming systems through integrated pest management. Next, please. As I've highlighted before, the trial sites are uh, primarily based at uh, for Samoa. It is USP Campus Samoa, where um, at both the sites and the second site, which is uh, Modi uh, Tonga, the the experiments will be for three years. Uh, we have already started with uh, with this year, and um, the. Uh, uh, with the USP Samoa, primarily we are looking at a crop livestock system, whereas for uh, Modi Tonga, we are looking for traditional mixed farming system in a three year rotation. At the same time, at both locations, we have farmer field sites, uh, which will be active for, for the life of the project um, for, for next three years. Next, please. What we expect from this project, uh, project um, that um, uh, when we have improved understanding of biophysical and basic e economic, uh, economic benefits, which these individual sustainable intensification components can bring and how they interact together. So we are looking at bringing um, 
potentially the 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 combined benefits of uh, the sustainable intensification components which i've highlighted not only at individual level but the interactions they bring together as well uh, and also uh, we are just not testing it we, we would like to understand more as we go with the project that what what are the early indicators of potential barriers uh, and what could be those enablers to make it possible to implement this sustainable intensification practices um, including a gendered implications at the same time. Next, please. Um, with this, I would like to thank you, um, uh, ACIR, for funding this project and all the team members from uh, different organizations. We are very passionate about this project and it would be great opportunity for students who are thinking for a master's or a PhD project to one at one of the trial location uh, at both the trial locations with us for various um, uh, in trust of areas they might have from crop to livestock to climate change to uh, gender related issues. And um, um, with this, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to present uh, project overview to all of you here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Gupta. That was a fantastic presentation. Uh, we'll move straight on now to um, Dr. James Butler, who is joining us from the Crothron Institute in New Zealand. Uh, his project is on transformation pathways for Pacific coastal food systems. And Dr. Butler, are you there? I understand that you are uh, sharing your own presentation today. Yeah. Um, my name is James Butler. Thank you, Linda. Um, can you just allow me to share my screen? Okay, I've stopped my sharing. Are you able to share yours now? Not yet. <clears throat> It says another participant is sharing. So I've stopped mine. Okay. Right. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very, very good, Linda. Um, I hope everyone can see that. Yes. Thank you. If you could just put it in slide mode. Uh -huh. oh, wonderful. How's that? Uh, it's just coming through now. Any good? Uh, we can see it, but it's not in slight mode. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, let's just see what's happening here. Um, how's that? <laughs> no, it's still the same. That's right. better. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, thanks, everyone. So, yes, I'm James Butler calling you from um, New Zealand. Um, as Linda said, the project we're running is called um, Transformation Pathways for Pacific Coastal Food Systems. And although my was, was mentioning um, um, earlier about um, quite a lot about agriculture um, and land-based food systems. This project is explicitly about uh, not just the land, but also the sea. So this about communities and their food systems living on, on the coast or on, on islands. Um, and um, the, the, the challenge which you all are well aware of is um, how are we going to produce food sustainably and, nutri and nutritional food sources in uh, the face of climate change, sea level rise, but also population growth and um, increasing land-based activities along the coast. Um, I think a, a statistic I saw fairly recently came out that said that 95% um, of people in the Pacific region live within five kilometers of the coast. Um, so this is clearly a, a, an issue for, for many, many, many people in, in the region. Um, so the goals of, of the, this project are to um, shift coastal food systems towards more climate resilient, prosperous and sustainable futures. Um, and in doing so, to build transformational capacity of stakeholders in two particular locations in the Solomon Islands and in Kiribati. Um, and through the project, we'll develop a process of community led planning that can be then scaled out to other locations within those countries. Um, but also hopefully further afield than that as well. So the details of the project, um, it's, it's not a huge project, um, $1.9 million, which is, which is um, uh, smaller than, 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 than quite a few in ACR. Um, it's spread over three years. We've only just started in, in March this year, um, but we finish in, in early 2026. That's three years. Um, the reason we've chosen the Solomons and Kiribati is because we want to compare food systems and food systems transformation in two different types of location, a sort of volcanic high island location 
and a coral atoll where the issues may be uh, completely different. The food systems are likely to be completely different as well. Um, so the partners of the Cawthorn Institute, that's where I'm based in, in Nelson in New Zealand. Uh, CSIRO in Australia, many of you will know, is the national research agency in Australia, uh, in fact, where I used to work. Um, uh, the University of Technology, Sydney, SPC, and then in the Solomon Islands, the uh, WWF is our main uh, on the ground partner. And in Kiribati, it's Live and Learn. And our, our key partners in government um, are the various ministries, particularly of agriculture, livestock, fisheries, um, and, um, and, and other ministries as well. Um, but then we're also tying in very closely to existing work that's funded by New Zealand's Ministry for Foreign Affairs and Trade um, and Australia's Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade who are running various projects in these locations as well. So we're trying to, to in, in engage and incorporate their, their efforts. So I thought as um, students and supervisors, you might be interested in some of the research questions that we're trying to ask through this, this project and see if there's anything here that um, interests you. Um, uh, so first question, um, and this is in no particular order of priority, um, <clears throat> first question then, how do communities, stakeholders and decision makers perceive food systems and food system transformation? It's a very broad term. Uh, transformation equally is a very broad term that can be interpreted in many, many different ways. So that's one of our first uh, sort of foundational questions is how do different people interpret this. Um, and of course, then that has implications for what we do about it. The second question is, what are the leverage points that will trigger food system transformation in the Solomon Islands and Kiribati. So we really want to understand the system and where the leverage points are, the points where if you addressed uh, issues or, or, or barriers or, or um, opportunities within the system that would then have a, a step change in, in the whole system. Um, and the third question is what participatory methods can support food system transformation? This is very much a project about planning and participatory processes. So we want to um, try and nail down what actually works and what doesn't, which therefore involves quite a lot of monitoring and evaluation and learning exercises to actually um, assess and analyze what worked and what didn't. Um, and that's what the fourth, fourth question is a little bit about. How do you measure transformative capacity? And fifth question, how do you enable knowledge brokers to continue the process of transformation and scaling out? We're very interested in this project in the idea of knowledge brokers who can emerge in communities or in um, agencies or, or, or government who effectively become champions for these sorts of processes and can maintain the change process long after our projects have finished. And so there's a big component in our work about understanding knowledge brokering, who they are, what they are, what they need, um, how they behave, how they can be supported. Um, <clears throat> and finally, the last question is about comparing food system transformation between different sorts of islands. Um, so um, the, um, uh, the two sites you might be interested in, um, this is Sagaragi village in, in Gizo, Western province in the Solomon Islands where we're focusing our studies. Um, and the other one is Abayang Island, um, just north of Tarawa in uh, Kiribati. Um, this is our sort of theory of change. Um, it's showing um, that, that um, the, um, uh, the project's running over, so three years, as I say. Um, I won't go into too much detail here, but it basically works through three phases. Phase one, roughly year one, is around preparing the system for change. Uh, phase two is the second year, which is about agreeing transformative pathways, what, what will they look like? And phase three is about implementing the pathways and um, potentially testing some new ideas that people may have. Uh, we've ring-fenced some funding um, to actually run some pilots uh, projects that uh, people may um, want to want to test um, and then we want to conduct monitoring evaluation and learning around the whole project and process but also around those pilot um, uh, test cases as well um, and then ultimately we we'll want to see this process as I said earlier mainstreamed and scaled out through our partners and other partners through the knowledge broker uh, network that we we're already establishing in the Pacific but this would link into that and we would generate more knowledge brokers as well through the process to, to take part in that, that broader community of practice across the region. So um, thank you very much. I hope that was enough, Linda, and provided enough of interest for, for everyone on the line. Um, thank, you. 
Thank you very much, Dr. Butler. That was fantastic and well kept time. Uh, I realize that we have a lot of um, project leaders here who are really excited to share uh, their projects with us today. Um, so let's move swiftly on uh, to Dr. Agnieszka Mudge uh, from the Queensland Alliance for Agriculture and Food Innovation at the University of Queensland. Uh, her project uh, is a crops project focusing on finding a genetic basis for oil palm responses to basal stem rot in a long-term infected lot. And I'll just see if I can share my screen again. Can everyone see that screen? Oh. Yeah, we can see okay, that. Okay, thank you very much. Over to you, Dr. Mudge. Thank you, Linda. Hello, everyone. Um, greetings from Brisbane. My name is Agnieszka Mudge. And I put in a tentative um, title for a possible masters um, under the PASIA program, which is effects beyond the crop, social and economic impacts of oil palm pests and diseases on smallholders in Solomon Islands. Next slide, please. Thank you. Ah, no, back. Back, please. Thank you. So this will be part of a crop 2021-130, which Linda wrote the proper title of. And it's a project with several components looking at various aspects of the oil palm cultivation and management. Um, it is a collaboration between us at the University of Queensland and also Papua New Guinea Oil Palm Research Association, based mostly in Dami in uh, West, West New Britain province, and also in, with Guadalcanal Palm Oil Limited, which is a plantation company in Solomon Islands on Guadalcanal Island. Um, so there's my email, if you'd like to email me. There are, like I said, there are many components to this, and, but broadly our aim is to improve livelihoods for smallholders in Solomon Islands and in Papua New Guinea. Next slide, please. So what is oil palm? Well, LA is Guinensis, this is a scientific name. It's a long-lived tropical monocot tree from West Africa. It's by long lived, it can live up to 150 years under good conditions, for example, like in a botanical garden. However, for the plantations, the cropping cycle is around 20 years. And for smallholders, sometimes it's pushed out to a bit longer than that, um, just because the, uh, of the cost of replanting. It is the biggest oil crop in the world, a source of 39% of the edible oils, but only uses 6.6% of the land that's used for oil crops. So it's highly efficient at producing oil. And the oil has both food and industrial applications. Um, for example, you can cook with it. You can use it in making chocolate. You can use it to make shampoos and soaps. And you can use it as bio oil as well. And roughly 40% of the production is done by smallholders. And that's sort of around the world. Um, the truth. Next slide, please. Now, there's... Oil palm industry in Solomon Islands is quite small. There are about 232 smallholder blocks. Um, that number can go up and down a little bit depending on various factors. And oil palm covers about 700 hectares. Um, so the smallest smallholder block is around one hectare, which would have 128, 130 palms. The biggest is 25.4 hectares, and that's over 3,000 palms. So that's quite a lot. Um, but the average is about just over three hectares with about 400 palms. And so the smaller um, oil palm block, the smallholders with smaller blocks would rely on other incomes, other crops for income. Next slide, please. And there's quite a lot high reliant, financial reliance on oil palm for income among the smallholders. It is the most important income source for supporting education. And we all know how important education is. It is reliable, constant income source, and that's because there is continuing harvesting of bunches, and that provides income. It is second to daily crop or vegetable market in Honya Central Market, um, provides financial support for community and church activities, and provides financial support for cultural occasions such as funerals, weddings, land issue settlement, passing on land title to other families and bride price and whatever else is happening in the community. 
Next slide, please. Now, there are various factors that affect productivity for the smallholders in, um, of oil palm. Some of it is access to information. And to address that, we have field days and where information is shared in various ways. Also, the maintenance of blocks and the management of those blocks will affect productivity, time management, for example, family. If smallholders are holding these are usually family based. Um, activities, if there's something happening in the family or in the wider community that affects how much time they can spend on the block. Um, obviously, weather and cyclones and stuff like that, but there's not much you can do about it. And then there are cultural activities and, of course, the presence of pests and diseases. Next slide, please. And there are quite a few, and there are some. Um, so you have tussock moth, you have the Orchis beetle, also known as coconut rhinoceros beetle. Um, bagworms are a problem too, and there's snails and rats and cockatoos. And my favorite is Ganoderma boninans. Next slide, please. And here is a picture of Ganoderma boninans. It's a pathogen, a fungal pathogen cause, which causes basal stem rot. Um, it's probably the worst disease in Southeast Asia region. And it has quite, can quite devastating. It actually kills the palms and a dead palm is not a productive palm. Um, so yeah, we're working mostly on that, but we're looking for, we have a lot of data actually on both smallholders and this disease and of various aspects of this project. So we're looking for, keen students who would like to come aboard and help us analyze it and maybe get some more data. And yeah, please contact me if you think you're interested. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mudge. That was fantastic and well kept time too. Uh, we're now going to move on to our horticulture uh, projects. Our first uh, project leader is Dr. Carmel Pilotti from Pacific Community uh, based in Fiji. And she is talking about her project today, safeguarding and deploying coconut diversity for improving livelihoods in the Pacific Islands. Are you there, Dr. Pilotti? I am. Thanks, Linda. Thank you. I'm not sure why my video is not. Oh, hang on. Right. Thank you. Hi, there, everyone. Hi. So, OK, so um, I'll be very quick because I believe I have too many slides. So I'll try to be very quick. Um, so basically, yes, uh, my project is on coconut diversity within the Pacific. Uh, I'm based in um, Suva, Fiji with SPC. Uh, we have six partners in the project. UQ, of course, is one of our uh, major partners. Um, uh, Dr. Steve Atkins' lab at the University of Queensland. Uh, we also have partners, uh, ministries of um, agriculture in Fiji, uh, Coconut uh, Commodity Board in PNG, and ministries of agriculture in Samoa, Solomon Islands, and Vanuatu. Next, please. So the project goal is basically to support the rejuvenation of coconut-based livelihoods uh, in Pacific Islands. And we want to start to do that by strengthening the conservation and utilization of the diversity that we have within the Pacific and try to address some of the biotic threats also to that diversity in the region. Next, please. So the project has uh, three objectives. The first one is to, to um, of course, develop and deploy strategies for coconut conservation. The second, to develop strategies to address some of the biotic threats uh, for, of coconut. And I won't talk much about objective three, basically to establish some kind of sustainable platform moving forward after the project. Thanks, Linda, next. Um, so under objective one, we, um, we have the main activities are to characterize and document um, the existing and new diversity um, in the Pacific. Uh, in coconut populations, and uh, we're looking at both phenotypic and genotypic diversity. And I've put other characteristics in there because we've put forward um, some um, topics, perhaps for students on this project, relating to nutritional aspects of coconut. Um, so that's that's sort of things to think about for students as well. It's not only um, we would like to have broader. Um, um, 
attachments uh, to the project, which include sustainable agriculture and nutrition and other things. So next slide, please. So we've just ha had one past student, which we are very grateful to ACR uh, past support to student, Sherlyn, who's just completed um, her studies on populations, coconut populations on Miti level. So next, please. Um, and so under objective one, uh, a lot of the support that we get from our University of Queensland counterparts relate to uh, coconut tissue culture. Um, and we also work in that area. So something for students to think about as well, if they want to have a project in, in the area of coconut tissue culture and multiplication. Next, please. Um, and of course, on the um, addressing biotic threats, uh, that's another area of research. Um, and we are focusing our attention here on Bogia coconut syndrome in Papua New Guinea. Uh, next, please, Linda. Also the coconut rhinoceros beetle, um, which is a huge, uh, has a huge impact on both coconut and oil palm in the Pacific. Next, please, Linda. Um, and objective three is basically to establish a platform. So we have some, some things going on as well with um, our um, broadening our partnerships as well in the coconut space with international um, agencies. So I think that's all from me, Linda. Next, I think it's just acknowledgements. Thank you to everyone, to ACR, and of course the past program for giving us a student um, who's completed her thesis now. Um, and thank you to all of our partners. Fine, that's all from me, Linda. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank, thank you very much, Dr. Pilotti. Uh, that was wonderful. A uh, really colorful presentation that you delivered <laughs> today. Uh, now uh, we're going to move on to our next uh, horticulture presentation. Uh, which is um, being delivered today by uh, Dr. Jean Bobby, I understand, um, on behalf of Dr. Julie O'Halloran, who is the project leader of um, the project uh, entitled Improving Root Crop Resilience and Biosecurity in Pacific Island Countries and Australia. Uh, so I have your presentation ready here. Welcome. Um, sorry, good morning. Can you all hear me? Yes, can hear you very well. Okay. Good morning from Gatton. Um, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land upon which we uh, work and would like to acknowledge the elders past, present and future. And thank you Pacific Agriculture Scholarship Support and Climate Res Resilience Program for the opportunity to be able to give an overview of the project that we are part of. As you have heard earlier, my name is Jean Bobby. And I work with um, Sweet Potato Research here in Gatton with other research colleagues as well. And we also have teams that are based at Bundy, um, Bundaberg Research Facility at Marimba. And just a correction on the title, I'm not a doctor yet, but you can call me a doctor for now. <laughs> so our project, the HOT um, 2018, slash 195 that's titled Improving Root Crop Resilience and Biosecurity in Pacific Island Countries in Australia is one of our current projects that is funded by ACR. And as uh, Linda said earlier, it's been led by Dr. Julie O'Halloran. Next, please. Oh, you stay there, that's right. Thank you. So the objective of the project is to develop pathogen tested clean sweet potato planting material. And secondly, to demonstrate improved planting practices to the participating countries. It is a three-year project to be implemented by four participating, participating Pacific Island countries, and that's Fiji, Solomon Islands, Samoa, and Tonga. We also have project partners um, for which um, the Center for Pacific Crops and Trees is one of them. We have the Ministry of Agriculture and Fisheries in Samoa, the Scientific Research Organization of Samoa, Ministry of Agriculture and Livestock of Solomon Islands, Custom Garden of Solomon Islands, Solomon Islands University, PIFON, which is the Pacific Islands Farmers Organization Network. And we also have University of Queensland as a, as a partner, as well as Graham Jackson. Next, please. So the background of the project is that sweet potato is identified as a food security and disaster reduction crop in Pacific Island countries. As such, to have a pity material with increased yield and faster maturity is critical when other food crops are damaged or destroyed. 
also to have clean materials to distribute instead of distributing materials which have been infested in the field, which is a biosecurity risk. Currently, there is no established PT scheme in the partner countries, but previous work by Fellow et al. in the 2019 have highlighted that um, non PT materials and poor propagation practices they potentially impact on yields by at least 50%. So, but PT schemes have shown to have increased yields of up to 30 tons per hectare in Australia and from 25 to 70% in Papua New Guinea with additional benefits of early maturity and improved root shape. Next, please. So the key project activities, as you can see on the slide, is that uh, the project will be engaging in a, in a survey of all the different sweet potato farming systems in the different, in the four participating countries. And based on the survey, we will identify the varieties of sweet potatoes that will be used in the PT scheme. So once the varieties have been um, identified, it will go through the PT process. And then um, the materials will be mass propagated and we will uh, establish a demonstration and field trial so that uh, different participating countries can come and have a look and see the difference between a PT and a non-PT uh, material. And um, we will also produce extension materials and communication materials such as fact sheets, case studies, and capacity building. Um, with the different, with the four Pacific Island countries that are part of the project. And um, Fiji will be used as a demonstration, as a model country for the demonstration of the different um, budgeting testing materials and the non-testing materials. I think those are the key four activities that we'll be engaged in. So with that, I would like to thank all of you for listening. On the photo, we have photos of um, stuff from SPC that have come over and we have started on our capacity building program. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jean. That was great. Uh, we'll move on now to uh, Dr. Saskia de Klerk, uh, who is a senior lecturer in international business from the University of the Sunshine Coast. Uh, Saskia is talking about um, a project that is uh, led by Dr. Sese uh, Molamau Samasoni from ESROS, and it's uh, titled Adopting a Gender Inclusive Participatory Approach to Reducing Horticultural Food Loss in the Pacific. Thank you, Saskia. Thank you. Um, sorry, I can't see the slides yet. There we go. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Um, well, thank you for this opportunity to share more about um, this project. Um, it's really about adopting a gender inclusive participatory approach, but also looking at horticultural uh, cultural loss um, in um, the Pacific across four um, countries, um, including Samoa, Tonga, Fiji, and the Solomon Islands. Um, basically, um, these are a a country coordinator for each of these countries as well, with Dr. Um, Molly Maus uh, Samasoni as the project lead in Samoa, um, and then also the coordinators, Associate Professor Suhani Batoro in um, Tonga, and Associate Professor Salesh Kuma in Fiji, and Mr. Leroy Joshua in the Solomon Islands. Um, but before I tell you a little bit more about that, um, I just want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which I meet uh, with you um, from today, um, the Gabi Gabi Kabi Kabi people, and acknowledge their connection to land, water, and community, as well as pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging. Next slide, please. Thank you. So the research opportunity here is really how can we reduce food loss um, with uh, value chains that experience high food loss rates, uh, what the value chains urgently need um, 
to uh, remediate um, itself, but also to think about how we can do that, how we can project through forecasting. Um, and also then to think about what causes um, or what's the drivers of this food loss in the value chains. And through um, investigating this, we use a gender inclusive uh, trace back survey approach to identify what drives the food loss um, along the selected food chains in fruit and vegetable uh, value chains. Um, and also then uh, with the interventions, we um, will um, provide some uh, alleviation or mediation um, to address the drivers, um, specifically through workshops, um, also to identify interve interventions that would be cultural specific and applicable in different settings. Um, and then also to think about uh, conducting on farm and in market um, by having the communities involved and participatory approaches um, to trial some of the interventions. Next slide, please. So really the anticipated outcomes and impact or outcomes of um, this research is to generate new knowledge on which um, commodities, locations, market systems, and uh, specifically the value chains that are most vulnerable to loss could be improved or um, supported in, in um, new ways to prevent food loss um, and uh, waste um, in, in future. Um, and this will be, um, conducted across Tonga, Fiji and Solomon Islands, um, then also to um, provide new knowledge on drivers, um, but also the attitudes and capacity of our vendors and, and all the different stakeholders across the, the value chain um, that could, um, through um, support, um, lead to less food loss. Next slide, please. So the overall goal of the project is really to increase food availability um, because of the high numbers of obesity and um, uh, really a, a, a a problem that um, we face in so many different settings to increase the food availability ultimately, but also to reduce the cost. Um, be because even with education, if it's not available, if it's um, not readily um, available where they need it, then um, the, the cost and, and all of those implications will prevent the successful implement implementation of these strategies. So reducing the cost of fruit and vegetables, um, increased purchasing and consumption then also of fruit and vegetables through strategies that we are going to um, develop. Um, and then also the, the more um, produce um, for sale. So in terms of capacity, but also to uh, think about the um, production stream and how that's managed, um, and then to um, provide um, opportunities and also strategies to increase profitability and income. Um, this will then um, lead to improved income uh, that translates into um, in increased um, purchasing um, behavior and more healthy food choices. So some of the topics that uh, we would like um, enthusiastic students to take up is basically sustainable practices in supply chain evaluations and development, um, especially thinking from a shareholder perspective, trying to get that holistic um, value chain um, approach. Um, and then also circular economy and community capital to look at um, how this is developed um, and also acknowledge the different partners in this through a cultural lens um, and then to also think about new product innovation ac across the value chain and valuing the voices of the um, you know already the practices that's in place but also to um, take those voices into consideration for future development as well and through ideation next slide please so to that's short and sharp, I hope, um, with the uh, contact details there of uh, Dr. Molimau Mamasoni uh, and um, also myself, I've, I've added my details there as well. I can just pass that along to the relevant team members. Um, if you are interested, please contact us. 
This is just an overview of the theory of change. Um, I'm not going to go through all of that. I think I covered that um, sufficiently. And I, but I just want to um, end off by thanking um, ACR and the PASS program and also all the stakeholders involved for having these opportunities available for um, students. Thank you, Saskia. And thank you for also sharing um, your thank yous at the end there. Um, we'll move now on to our social systems uh, project leaders. So our first project leader is Associate Professor Deborah Hill, uh, who is joining us today from the University of Canberra. Good morning. Good morning. We'll just wait for the slide. Okay. Um, so ours is a really quite a small program, and um, so I'll, I'll just outline it uh, for you. Um, and also, I should start by saying that we um, it's a five year project, um, but we're more than halfway through. So we um, began it in 2020, and we finish in uh, the end of next year. So so any projects that would be associated with us would be, um, I guess, a master's uh, level project. Um, so the project is called Improving Agricultural Development Opportunities for Female Smallholders in Rural Solomon Islands. That's quite a, a mouthful, um, but it's also known as the Family Farm Teams um, Project Solomon Islands or sometimes just FFT Solomon Islands. Um, I'll, the, I'll explain the objectives of the program and then just give you a, a sort of a, a snapshot of where we are at the moment. Um, so the, we have two objectives, and, and one is simply that the Family Farm Teams Project, which is a family-based action learning program um, that, is also, that works um, in a way with a peer learning um, component within communities, and then also is, is run typically um, alongside some other kinds of livelihood training, which includes agricultural training and other kinds of livelihood um, training. So this, this family farm team's approach um, has already been successful in Papua New Guinea. And so this particular project in the Solomon Islands was a way of, of seeing whether the family farm team's approach would could be adapted into another location in some ways similar, but of course, in other ways, very different Solomon Islands from Papua New Guinea. So one of our objectives is simply to see whether the family farm team's approach of agricultural extension um, can be applicable in the Solomon Islands, what kinds of adaptations were needed, um, you know, was it was it a sort of suitable sort of program uh, for another um, Pacific location. So that was one of our objectives. Um, a second ob objective was around the opportunities that particularly female smallholders would have in terms of agriculture. And so we work primarily or we work in our particular project in communities and we um, have family-based groups um, in workshops. And the idea is to see whether or not there are further opportunities that we can help them with to um, enhance their, their subsistence lifestyle or their semi-subsistence lifestyle and how we can help them sort of into the future. So we don't necessarily uh, change things for them except by offering some training, but work with them to see what could change in the future. Um, as I mentioned, we're uh, sort of more than halfway through. So part of that has meant that we have actually had a chance to revise some of the materials um, for this project. And so we have a new Solomon Islands manual. And there on the slide, um, I have just a picture of the, the sections of the manual so that I could explain to you what goes into this program. Um, firstly, I should say that we start by working with um, women and another member of their family. So we talk about the people that participate in our program as, as village community educators, because once they do the training with us, they then go and train other people in their community, particularly obviously people in their families, um, but throughout the community. Uh, one aspect of, of our research has also been to track this peer learning. And so that's been, for me, a very interesting part of the project um, looking looking at who people train after they, they do this. So we talk about the workshops as being um, attended by family pairs. We start with a, a woman and then one member of her family, a male member that's appropriate. It could be her husband, but it could be um, a nephew, it could be an uncle. It just depends on what seems appropriate for that particular community. 
In the first location that we um, did our project, we had about 50 um, village community educators or VCEs. And after the peer learning um, aspect of the program, we reached perhaps a, about 650 people in all. So it can sort of spread out quite well. Um, in one of the photographs, or in both of the photographs, you can see there, there is the agricultural component. So in, as I said, in, in addition to the family farm team learning that they do, we work alongside um, livelihood training. In this case, it was run by Custom Garden Association in the Solomon Islands. And you can see one photo where they're looking at uh, plants to sort of look at pests and so on, so they can learn about um, mitigating issues with, with pests. And in the other one, they're, they're looking at a garden to sort of develop a demonstration garden. Um, and then they they um, they learned about crop rotation, which was had a great impact in that community, I have to say, sort of learning about crop rotation and how that could um, enhance yield and also just allow them to develop a smaller, smaller use smaller crops, plots of land um, to create more food, etc. Um, so let me sort of quickly say something just about the, the range of things that we do in, in the actual program. There, as I said, four modules, um, or there are four sort of workshops, uh, but we tend to do them sort of two, two together and then another two together at another place. Um, and so the first one is called decision making and communicating as a family farm team. So, and the second one is working as a family farm team for family goals. So both of these are very much about sort of working together as a family and, and allowing people to sort of, if you like, reflect on what they already do, what works well, what doesn't work well within the cultural context. Um, and then this allows them to, to, I suppose, more effectively take on board any new other kinds of technical learning they might get from, say, the, the custom garden training. And I can imagine this kind of training also working well with some of the other um, technical training that I've heard other project leaders talk about. Um, and then the second, so that's the first part, and then they go off after that and, and uh, train others. And then uh, they come back, back after some weeks and there's a, a second lot of training with two more modules. And here we focus very much on the family farm or the garden, and then also a, around food and nutrition. So while this is, um, this is a family-based workshop and we focus very much on things like gender awareness and so on, we have very strong links to things like food security and nutrition. And indeed, um, at least in the first location that we uh, did our, our work, uh, we found that that the idea of increasing the food intake um, for children, for, for women, for everybody, and growing a lot more food was a very important part of the project. Um, and yet it wasn't necessarily the aim of the project. So this idea of linking, improving, um, working together as family, awareness of gender equity and so on, but also in conjunction with things like having more food available and having more food to sell to, to um, increase the amount of money that is circulating in the community. These were also very important sort of um, sort of results that we, we've had so far in, in the project. Uh, so I'll leave it there and um, I welcome further questions at another time. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Hill. That was great. Uh, I'm now moving on to uh, Dr. Mary Johnson, uh, who's joining us today from RMIT University. Uh, Mary is talking today uh, about her project Land Care, an agricultural extension and community development model at district and national scale in Fiji. Uh, and over to you, Mary. Thank you, Linda. Uh, hello, everyone. And thank you for the opportunity to share this project with people. It's been very interesting listening to others so far. So uh, the Land Care Agricultural Extension Project is based in Fiji, but you'll see from the first slide that there are a number of uh, partners that are part of this project. It sits within the social sciences and it's very much about extension and relationships and all the components that go with that. Next slide, please, Linda. Uh, if we can just go back one. Okay, so the project's running over four years and it's partnership between Fiji, the Philippines and Australia. You'll just see in that diagram uh, partners listed there, but I don't want you to think about this diagram as being com in compartments because it's not. Uh, we, we, we have uh, partnerships, of course, with ACR and in the Philippines, the uh, uh, Philippine Council, they're funding agricultural R&D, research, operational, 
and uh, capacity building, but each, each one of those entities is part of a team that will be working together and working with farming communities. Next slide, please, Linda. So the context of the project is that it sits within um, uh, Fiji, it's a, a Pacific Island nation, and of, there's, of course, we all know that 80% of uh, populations uh, depended directly or indirectly on, ag on the agricultural sector. So our project is working with the uh, farming community. Uh, it's, it's very much around food and nutrition uh, security, but also all the other components that go about being a farm and a farm family. And the key to it all is around the extension and how extension and all the components, the service providers and the people who are involved in extension, whether it's government departments, farmer organisations, NGOs, whoever, how we go about working with each other to help farm, um, farmers uh, identify their problems and issues and to help solve these. So next one. Uh, next slide, please. So the aims of the project are to test whether an extension model linked to community development can be adapted from one country from, uh, to another. And this is where the relationship between the Philippines and Fiji is really important. There was an eight year project funded by ACR that worked with conflict vulnerable communities in Mindanao. And again, was working on extension models that um, would, would suit uh, the, the particulars of the farming communities there. But because it, there's such a complexity of problems these days with around farming, uh, climate change, uh, the management of our natural resources, productivity itself, uh, gender equality, uh, there, there are complexities around working in the area of extension and development. So this project aims to build on existing projects, existing learnings and initiatives, and it is very much about the relationship that's um, forming and developing between the Philippines and Fiji, a South-South relationship facilitated by uh, Australia and through uh, support from Australian entities. So it's about strengthening partnerships locally, nationally and internationally. Next slide, please. In Fiji, the project sites are on Viti Levu at Sigatoka, the salad bowl, and we're working with uh, community groups there, farming groups. Also Labasa on Vanua Levu, uh, where we've got uh, uh, more uh, farmer-based groups that we're working with, existing groups. And the third site is on Taviuni, where we're working with a very strong team from Tete Taviuni Farmers Association. Next slide, please. The research questions around this project are can a land care life extension methods, the land care life extension methods, which were developed in the Philippines, can they be adapted? Are there principles that carry to other countries or in other situations? And what are these principles and what, and what would be appropriate for Fiji? So sub-questions include what are the preconditions that already exist to uh, enable adaptability? How can the extension methods contribute to gender equity? And what's the appropriate scale for intervention? And who are the most appropriate partners to support uh, implementation of extension programs? Next slide, please. So just very quickly, a little bit about land care. It uh, emerged out of natural resource management uh, um, challenges. It's a, a global uh, uh, movement now. It's a movement fund, uh, based on local community action, a model about sharing knowledge and support mechanisms that help broad scale community participation. And that it's a ethic of the way that people live and work in landscape. And that's a really important part of our project too, is to acknowledge respect, um, the respective cultures of the countries that we're working within. Next slide, please, Linda. 
Okay, the LIFE model, which was uh, what came from the eight-year extension project in the Philippines in Mindanao, was based on three concurrent approaches. So facilitate farmer access to technical innovations, build community and institutional capacity, and very importantly, collaborate closely with the partnerships that are going to be able to help farmers in um, developing uh, mechanisms for for farming and for the challenges that they're facing. Next slide, please, Linda. So anticipated outcomes, improved agricultural livelihoods, but within natural resource management uh, focus and practices, a greater ability to cope with some of the challenges that farmers are facing these days, active and collaborative, and I stress the word active, partnerships between Fiji and the Philippines and Australia, and mutual research interests that are shared and enhanced and disseminated. Nearly there. Next one. Okay, so the past scholarship, um, and thank you to ACR and the past scholarship team. Uh, it's a wonderful initiative. Um, we're, we're offering through the Fiji National University uh, Masters um, opportunity. I'm sorry, in the program, we, it was ticked masters and uh, a PhD, but because there's only two years left of this project, uh, a master's opportunity is there. Possible topic is Fiji agricultural policy driving soil degradation, a case of Dalo and Yagona farming in on Tabiuni Island. So the summary around that is what the in farmers and the researchers are interested in and the extension officers is that um, Taro and Yagono industry has been very successful. It's been supported by the Fiji government, but there's been uh, um, unanticipated downside where forest land's been cut down to open up new areas and it's causing significant soil degradation. So we're looking to run a case study on, on Taviuni. Last slide, I think, Linda. And so thank you very much for the opportunity to share this. Project contacts, Dr. William Carew at FNU and myself. And there are other, um, Dr. Shipra Shah, Dr. Salesh Kuma, and Aloisi Dekua Draketi, who is our project manager, uh, will all be part of this project. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Johnson. That's great. Uh, now we're going to move on to uh, a soils, uh, soil and land management project. Um, we have Dr. Uta Stockman, I hope, <laughs> joining us today and sharing her screen. Uh, the project is um, a soils project, as I said, it's soil management in Pacific Islands, investigating nutrient dynamics and the utility of soil information for better soil and farming system management. I'm hoping you're there, Dr. Uta. I am. My camera doesn't seem to work. Is that right? Uh oh. I'm stopped sharing my screen. If you could share your screen now. Okay. No, we can't see you. Yeah, I, I'm sorry about that. I'm That's not okay. sure what's wrong. Um, oh. Let's see if that has worked. That's wonderful. If you could just put it in slide mode. Okay. Thank you, that, that's great. Yeah, it came through. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, ACNs. Thank you also to the PASS program for giving me the opportunity to introduce our project as part of the soil and land management stream. Um, I'm presenting also on behalf of Dio and Till and Ben McDonald, um, who couldn't join us today. So I'm together with Ben, the project leader of our ACR project that looks into soil management in Pacific Islands. And this project builds on an existing project, um, which also looked at uh, using soil information to improve 
knowledge and farming system resilience. And if you like to find out a little bit more, then uh, you can go to our website and I hope that you can see that screen now that I've shared. Is, is the website coming up, Linda? Yes, yes, we can yes. see it, thank you. Okay, <laughs> so one of the achievements of the previous project is the building of the Pacific Soils portal, which you can see here and you can explore as well, which basically brought together existing legacy information from the region and translated it towards a land suitability output. So you're welcome to explore this further. And I'm going to give a short introduction to our project followed by more specific um, introductions to the projects that we would like to offer that will link to the project. So the aim of our phase two is to continue to improve farming systems resilience in the Pacific Island countries and territories through improved soil management and soil knowledge. Our project is based in Fiji, Vanuatu, Tonga and Samoa and we're working with the ministries of agriculture in Vanuatu, Fiji and Tonga. And we're also working with the University of the South Pacific in Samoa and the scientific research organization Samoa. We're also working with the Pacific community and Manaki Venua Landcare Research is also involved in the project. So it's a multi-partner, multidisciplinary project for four years. And the aim of this project is to further develop our Pacific Soils portal, which holds our soil information system for the Pacific. And we are also working towards operating this portal out of the Pacific community. Um, in addition, the portal will now be expanded to Vanuatu. Vanuatu is new to this phase two of the project um, to also improve um, our linkage of the portal to agriculture policy advisors and extension courts. Um, one objective of our project is um, that we will aim to develop the capability to utilize field-based technologies, such as spectroscopy in the near-infrared spectrum for rapid soil condition analysis. And we also hope to introduce laboratory-based um, technologies, again, to quantify soil health and the project is centered on soil carbon as a proxy for functional attributes. Um, our project extension will be focused on the characterization of soil carbon state and trend and on identifying with the landholders suitable farming management. And in that regard, our project is linked with Dorin's project who started the presentations today. Um, our aim is that the project's ultimate impact will be recognized in Samoa, Tonga, Vanuatu, and Fiji, benefiting from improved land resource planning, more profitable agricultural land uses, and resilient and sustainable landscapes through access of relevant soil information. So now we are offering um, a range of projects, and we are we're hoping that you're interested in those. Um, with the Fiji National University, we are hoping to look for a master's project in the mitigation of soil salinity constraints for improved productivity of irrigated horticultural crops. This project will be based in the Sigutoka Valley in Fiji and has three objectives. So we're here hoping to use field-based experiments to quantify the effect of water quality on key indicators of soil quality and productivity, and also the quality of horticultural crops, um, such as tom tomatoes. We're also hoping to use model simulations, maybe integrating the EPSIM model to estimate solute and water balances in irrigated soils used for horticultural production, and to also develop a set of irrigation and soil management strategies. 
We're also offering a PhD project that looks towards a mechanized taro production system, which will also be based in Fiji with four objectives. Um, we're hoping to establish a series of field-based experiments to determine the impact of plant spacing on taro yield and its yield components, and also look into the resource use efficiency of the system. We're also hoping to determine the optimal crop configuration for a mechanized taro production system, along with what machinery would be best. Um, and again, to use crop model simulations to assess responses um, in terms of climate change and, environment, and other environmental scenarios. Um, and ideally, we would also like to undertake an economic evaluation of alternative crop configurations. We also have a range of projects. Um, oh, there's some noise. <laughs> um, with a, again, with the Fiji National University, they could be masters or PhD projects. One looks at the geospatial and temporal distribution of plant available nutrients and soil fertility in Tonga. So this is also linked to our Pacific soil portal work. Um, the project is really aimed at measuring the distribution of soil nutrients as a function of landscape position and management in Tonga. And the project will utilize historic, historic legacy data as well as new data. Um, another project that could also be a master's or PhD um, is the development of a farm scale soil strategy to support ecosystem services and food and fiber security. This project is really aimed at how farmers could develop a soil management strategy for their land, what could be the barriers of implementation, what could be solutions, what activities should be undertaken, how should data be managed, what data need to be recorded, and is there a specific, specific solution? They are, there is a project that we're going to offer both at the Fiji, Fiji National University and the University of the South Pacific um, that looks towards sustainable farmscapes through geospatial mapping. This project will also be linked to the Pacific Soils portal and can be based in Tonga, Samoa or Fiji. Um, the project itself is aimed at measuring the distribution of soil properties of economic importance at a regional or a farm scale using techniques of geospatial mapping. Um, the project will also utilize some legacy data or existing data, but will also collect new soil data. Um, it will also link with our Pacific Soil Portal outreach activities, in particular to develop the connections with stakeholders and to identify communication pathways to ensure that the soil spatial information that we develop is delivered in appropriate ways for decision making. And last but not least, there's going to be one project that's only going to be offered at the University of the South Pacific that is looking into using taro macro and micro, micronutrient contents um, and linking those with, uh, with human nutrition. So here in this project, we are interested in understanding how different soil types and potentially land management strategies can change taro nutritional properties and composition how does this actually translate to human nutrition? There has been some previous research on this topic, which was ACR funded. Um, so we're looking here at also, are there any differences in the chemistry of um, the carbohydrates, et cetera, um, of taro production systems and why? Thank you, Linda. Thank you very much, Uta. It's very interesting topics you have uh, for the soils project. Uh, now I'm just going to share my screen again. I should have stopped sharing. Yes, thank you. Yes. Uh, now we have uh, 
one of our very own University of the Sunshine Coast uh, senior researchers from ACPIA, Professor Paul Southgate. Uh, professor Paul Southgate is a professor of sustainable tropical aquaculture here at the University of the Sunshine Coast. And his project is uh, a fisheries project uh, looking towards more profitable and sustainable Mabe, pearl and shell based livelihoods in the Western Pacific. Over to you, Paul. OK, thanks, Linda. Um, morning, everybody. And uh, given how far we are down the presenters list, uh, <laughs> thanks for hanging in there. Um, so as Linda mentioned, um, I'm from uh, UniSC. Um, I'm a um, marine aquaculturist or mariculturist. Uh, my research specialization is is pearls and, and developing pearl based livelihoods uh, in Pacific communities. Um, despite the name or sorry, the number associated with this project, it, this is a new project. It didn't start in 2019. It started early this year and it's a five year project. Um, while I still have this slide, I'll um, introduce the the Marbe Pearl, which are those that are shown in the in the photograph. Um, this is really the focus of this project. So looking at interventions at various points along the value chain. Um, on the basis that we've already established a number of communities in Fiji and Tonga um, that are now um, developing livelihoods around production of Marbe pearls. Uh, why Marbe? Um, easier to produce, probably half the, or around half the culture time compared to round pearls. And it's something that local people can achieve themselves, the, the seeding procedure uh, with, with limited training. Whereas round pearl production requires um, usually uh, highly skilled overseas technicians. Thanks, Linda. Okay, so objectives and country partners. Um, the objective um, is to improve production, livelihoods, and small business opportunities um, within the artisanal Marbe pearl and pearl shell handicraft sectors in the Pacific. The country partners are Fiji, Tonga, Samoa, and Papua New Guinea, and the respective agencies in each of those countries, um, they're, they're the government uh, fisheries agencies, so working generally with the Ministry of Fisheries uh, partners. I should also mention that this is a project, ah, oh, jumping the gun, Linda. <laughs> This, um, this, this project um, is built, it's, it's, it's almost a culmination of probably 10 or 12 years of research, ACR funded research, which has looked at developing these. Given that the cycles of pearl production are, you know, one to two years, um, it's a, yeah, I think a reasonable timeline. Thank you, Linda. So um, the, the purpose of these slides is just to run you really through the process, uh, what is involved. Um, so we currently have, we, we have worked um, or we have developed um, working relationships with around 26 or 27 communities in Fiji um, and about the same in Tonga, slightly less, um, based around spat collection. Now spat are the juveniles of the pearl oysters. They're valuable for round pearl production so they can be sold to round pearl producing farms. Um, if we move uh, left to right on the, the, the top row of photographs, the one far left at the top shows a, a spat collector, which has juvenile pearl oysters. And many of the communities are involved in putting these, they're, they're, they're basically onion bags or, or plastic um, settlement substrates into the water at the right time of the year as a recruitment substrate for pearl oysters. After a, a, an appropriate time of, of deployment, they can be removed from the water and the juvenile pearl oysters taken off. And the second photograph shows a lady in one of our communities with the juvenile oysters and they've been attached to a rope. The rope will then be put out to sea and the oysters grown. It will, they will be grown to a point where they can be used for Marbe pearl production. The third photograph, so middle top row, um, shows a, a, a lady from a community um, that is seeding for pearl production. And the process is, once the oysters are large enough, a hemispherical plastic nucleus is literally super glued to the inside surface of the oyster shell. Um, the oyster then is returned to the water, which we can see on the next photograph to the right of that, um, put on a, a dropper rope, uh, with, with other oysters and then put back into the ocean 
for again around a year. Uh, it takes a year for the pearls to form. So photograph left hand side bottom row um, within the year that they're cultured for Marbe pearl production, maintenance of the, the oysters is required. And very often um, in, in lots of our communities, they have a boat. This particular one doesn't, it's a, a locally made bamboo raft that serves the same purpose. So a year, maybe, maybe monthly examination of the oysters. And after that 12 months, the next photograph to the right shows the same Marbe pearls that can be harvested. Um, we have trained communities to make handicrafts and, and high level or high end jewelry items as well, which is the next photograph shown, um, usually with um, you know, traditional motifs um, and definitely with locally available um, raw materials, um, which uh, are, uh, are generally required. And um, the final photograph, uh, bottom row, um, far right hand side, um, we've done a lot of trials to, to show that communities that we train can make retail ready items that sell very well through um, outlets such as Tarpoos um, and Jacks in, um, in Fiji. And the lady shown here, uh, it's a community group we worked with in Fiji, um, proudly showing off their display in the Tarpoo shop at, at Nandi Airport. So that is the basis for what we're doing. We're basically trying to maximize community benefits and outputs from this system that we've developed. We currently have around six or seven communities that have or have already or are about to produce Marbe pearls um, this year. Thank you, Linda. Okay, so- um, Thank you, Paul. <laughs> What, you have what another the, slide. Sorry? Did you want to? Did you want to talk about this slide? Yes. 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 Okay. Please. So, um, as I mentioned, um, eight, eight um, pearl farms either have produced or will produce Marbe pearls this year. Um, the project was reviewed a couple of years ago, and one of the issues that came up was the um, sustainability. So, environmental. Um, sustainability primarily, and access to this value chain um, by ordinary community people. And that concern related primarily to, to the fact that um, cultural pearl oysters, as shown in the photograph on the uh, bottom left, um, is usually achieved with imported ropes. Um, they're made of plastic and they're quite expensive. So issues around that are use of plastic. It, it degrades over time, um, little bits fall off, um, these are generally cultured in areas of, of pristine reefs, so um, there's a plastics in the environment uh, issue there as well. Availability in some of the more remote locations in Fiji and Tonga, it's very hard for local people to, to, to access um, the, the required level or, or, or um, quality of rope. Cost, because these are imported, it's very often cost prohibitive for people to enter the sector. Um, so those three issues themselves are, um, are problematic and restrict sector expansion in both Fiji and Tonga. Um, so um, potential solutions relate to look at, looking around the region and looking at other pearl farming areas, Cook Islands and, and French Polynesia. Many of the uh, community-based culture uh, ventures in, in those countries use locally available materials such as bamboo. And there is also demonstration of the fact that um, if you use a bamboo raft, for example, it creates a three dimensional culture system that has a fish aggregating impact, which improves food security for local local communities. Basically, they have access to more fish as a result of changing the, the, the culture system model from a single plastic line, as shown in this photograph, to a three dimensional system. So the idea is that um, this project or one of the projects we're offering will look at that, will we'll look at aspects of that change of system, because if it is successful, it will facilitate sector expansion and entry into the uh, into the sector by uh, by communities. Thank you, Linda. So um, in, in terms of the student projects we're offering, there are two. Um, this is the first. 
it basically is looking at various aspects associated with the potential for changing the culture methodology from a, 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 a two-dimensional um, rope, imported rope-based system to a three-dimensional um, bamboo-based raft system, which has been shown to be successful in other, other parts of the world. Bamboo is cheap and readily available um, in both countries. Um, but there are no data at this stage as to how it might perform um, under Fijian conditions. So that is the basis for um, this project. Thanks, Linda. So um, potential research issues. Um, these are by no means set. Um, there is a lot to, to unpack, to use uh, modern terminology um, with, with this research scenario. Um, and some of the things that could be looked at is um, pearl performance. So do, do the pearl oysters grow as quickly? Are the pearls they produce as good? Do they have a, a nacre that is as thick and therefore um, a, a similar uh, quality? So oyster performance, uh, pearl yield and quality, um, fouling and predator abundance. The fact that you have you created a 3D habitat, does that mean you have more predators that affect the growth rate of pearl oysters, et cetera? If so, what are those predators? What time of year do they recruit to the culture system, et cetera? Um, establishment of operational costs and input, input costs and, and requirements. So labor uh, requirements, for example, cost benefit analysis is something that runs through all of the work that we do to assess these changes that we make to systems. Um, is RAF-based culture compatible with local lifestyles? Um, that, that doesn't only deal with the, the amount of time required to, 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 to use these systems, but also does it fit in with, say, uh, marine protected area uh, management um, aspects, those sorts of things. And I've already mentioned the final bullet point here, which is the to assess the fish aggregating potential. My gut feeling is that we could develop these systems which are cheaper and far more practical um, and that there would be a positive uh, food security or, or, or fish access um, benefit from using them. But we don't know. We don't know. Um, little note at the bottom here, Pranesh is part of the, um, the, the, the people here today. Um, Pranesh has worked with me. He, he was a student on one of my ATR projects a while ago. I hate to think how, how long ago now. He's now the um, postdoctoral uh, project scientist. Uh, he's Fiji based. So this project would be uh, would have uh, local supervision, not just supervision um, that comes um, from from Australia. So Pranesh is the one that deals with the uh, regularly visits all of our partner communities that sets up most of the um, most of the experiments and collects data, et cetera, and works with communities. Um, so the idea with this project, it will be USP based. Um, the field work would occur at partner communities in Fiji. Thank you, Linda. Thank you very much, Paul. That's now there's great. one more. <laughs> At least there was when I said it. <laughs> no, one back, please. Okay. Um, so that that really is a project that we'd like to suggest for um, for Fiji. Um, one that involves both Fiji and Tonga is based around the genetic structure and population connectivity of pearl oysters in Fiji and Tonga. And this is quite, for, for the right student, this would be a, a, a very nice project. Um, the, the Tongan Marve pearl sector is built on oysters that were brought from Japan by a Japanese company in the mid-1970s. We are unsure whether they are, the same species is endemic, whether they brought them in for a certain quality of, of pearl to be produced, or whether they brought them in because they didn't exist previously in Tonga. So all of the, um, all of the culture um, of, of pearl, so that the whole pearl sector in Tonga is based on hatchery produced juveniles. Um, and because of that, there are issues potentially as well, gen genetic or bottlenecking uh, issues, if you like. So, this project is based around some of those questions. Um, so natural stocks, um, information on natural stocks, information of what is happen happening genetically through repeated um, hatchery production um, is, is vital for continuation 
uh, or continuing the expansion of that sector. Um, and other aspects of this relate to the photograph shown here on the right. Um, gold is one of the most desirable pearl colors. This, the, the picture shown here still has the animal in, so the pearl hasn't been harvested. But again, um, basic information around the genetic makeup of the stock, which could form the basis of selective breeding in the future in Tonga, given that all of the uh, supply, all of the oysters used are produced in the hatchery, i.e. Uh, would provide a good basis for selective breeding in the future. Thank you, Linda. So uh, potential research issues here on the genetic side, investigate the genetic origin of Tongan oysters. Are they endemic? Uh, detect any residual genetic bottlenecks in cultured populations um, because of the um, limited number of broodstock and continued culture from, from the hatchery, again, with limited broodstock. Determine levels of genetic diversity within the wild and cultured oyster populations and the presence of local adaptions. Um, look at connectivity with Fiji. Um, and uh, as part of that, look at larval dispersal patterns uh, across the two countries. This relates to similar work that we have done um, across the Indian Ocean and across the Pacific for another species of pearl oyster um, and for sea cucumbers as well. Uh, this work would be um, done in collaboration with Dr. Manal Lau, um, who is also, like Pranesh, is a Fiji-based um, research scientist on the current ACR project. The field work will be done in Tonga and the analysis will be done um, at USP. I think that's it, Linda. Thank you, Paul. Um, that was great. Uh, a little bit longer than five minutes, I have to say, but thank you. No, I think I think if you have come before have pushed it as <laughs> Once well. Once you get your talking. <laughs> I'm just very aware of the time, everyone, and we have two more presentations and then we'll go out into the Zoom breakout rooms. Uh, so our next presenter is Dr. Sharice Adensal, who, uh, who is also from the University of the Sunshine Coast. Uh, she has a, a new project starting on climate smart regenerative ridge to reef landscapes for sustaining livelihoods of communities on custom land and food security in Vanuatu. Sharice, are you with us? Perhaps sure. Oh, I can see you. In, Hi, uh, there you are. Thank you. Sorry, having a little bit of an internet issue, but I'm here. I'm <laughs> using a cafe Wi Fi. <laughs> oh, so I thank hope you. it's not too noisy. Um, but are you okay to do the slides for me? Yes, I'm ready for you. Okay, great. Thanks, everyone. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes, okay. sure. Is. Yeah, okay, great. So, morning. Um, Yes, in, oh, after, we're in afternoon now. No, we're still in morning here, <laughs> where I am. Um, maybe afternoon for many of our Pacific people. But I'm um, really excited to be presenting today. I'll try and keep it really quick um, to meet the time. Uh, but I'm presenting on the ACR project in the Social Systems Division titled Climate Smart Regenerative Ridge to Reef Landscapes for Sustaining Livelihoods of Communities on Custom Land and Food Security in Vanuatu. Um, the University of Sunshine Coast is the Australian commissioned organisation and the Australian Centre for Pacific Islands Research is also a collaborating partner. Uh, the project is going uh, through the Department of Environmental Protection and Conservation as the government entity and the in-country project lead is Lorana Raquel Takataki. She's the operations manager for the not-for-profit organisation Regeria Vanawa. Uh, this was formally registered in Vanuatu uh, three years ago, I think. Um, however, it has Indigenous board members from throughout the Pacific, Australia and New Zealand. Uh, Regenerative Vanuatu's mission is to build climate smart, resilient regenerative communities and regeneration of Vanuatu. Um, I don't believe I probably need to explain Vanuatu to the Pacific colleagues. Um, I know it's a different term in many countries. Fiji, I believe, uses Vanuatu. Uh, but it's really about the community and land that you identify with. So the vision of Regeria Vano is to restore pride in Indigenous food culture through Regeria agritourism and food tourism, Regeria farming and food systems and Regeria landscapes. We're also working with the Global Agritourism Network Pacific Committee, which was launched earlier this year. 
and our other partner is Live and Learn Vanuatu, who are applying really innovative approaches to conservation management to their range of program and their carbon projects in Vanuatu. Okay, thanks. If you could, yep, thank you. Okay, so the project aim, um, sorry, just getting my screen. The project aim is to apply critical participatory action research methods to empower targeted communities and community conservation areas in Vanuatu to develop rights-based regenerative climate smart ridge to reef landscape and food system design and management plans that support food and nutrition security and over wellbeing. So therefore the research project aims to work with the communities that are either in the process of acquiring CCAs or have already registered CCAs to develop a model for guiding management plans within their CCA and buffer areas and support climate smart ridge to reef regenerative landscapes. Thanks. So this research came about um, when we were actually working on a uh, agritourism program with some operators up in the north um, and we went up a few years before for an FAO project where they established a CCA uh, with the Department of Environment. Um, within that CCA there was incredible sophisticated traditional agricultural systems that had been passed down generations, particularly one that stood out was the water terror gardens. Now this uh, agricultural practice is inherently climate resilient. It improves biodiversity. It's actually a fish breeding habitat area um, and many other insects, etc. And it's a highly sourced crop within the markets. Literally, when water terror hits the markets, it's sold out um, very quickly. Uh, so it's something that needs to be uh, supported and, and protected. However, when we went up uh, just recently for our agritourism program, we saw these gardens have been removed from the CCA. We talked to the community and they were told that they're not allowed to grow food in a conservation area. So there we saw already that these are uh, either a miscommunication or potential, um, uh, definitely maybe application of a Western style uh, approach to conservation that we thought could potentially be impacting not just on traditional knowledge systems, but food security. So we then developed a uh, project to get a better understanding of what's going on within the communities that have formalised CCAs. Thanks, Linda. So this is a lot of text, but I just wanted to show you how um, our CPR cycle links the research questions, objectives and outputs. I won't read through all that, but if anyone wants to contact me, I'm happy to share. Um, this cycle and explain more outside of this presentation. Um, but really, the, what it seeks to do through the cycle is review current approaches to CTA management and the barriers and opportunities for supporting regenerative climate smart livelihoods, frame revised CCA management plans linking climate adaptation, conservation, food systems, nutrition, health, and development in CCAs and the buffer areas develop a pathway model and build capacity linking to Live and Learn's range of programs and the agritourism program, and pilot and evaluate these interventions and support linkages and synergies to larger climate focused projects operating throughout Vanuatu. As you know, most ACR projects, they're usually uh, very high in capacity and low in budget. So we, we intend to link to projects already operating that have the opposite, high, high finances and low capacity. And we hope that this can really add value to those projects. Yep, next one. So these are just our, some of our uh, project partners within Vanuatu. Uh, we've got a kind of chain of command, if you will. There's a new approach in Vanuatu now that you uh, must have a project advisory group that uh, to ensure what you're doing reaches up to government level whenever you're doing a climate related project. Uh, I think obviously this is brought about as uh, the finance for climate related projects is increasing. The government wanted to get a firm understanding of who's doing what and where. Then we have our management group, which is the part, as I mentioned earlier, Sunshine Coast, Regenerative Funnel, Live and Learn and the Department of Environment. We're also working with other organisations to implement the research like VRTC, the provincial government and the ranges that are already established through the Live and Learn program. 
Uh, our outcomes, uh, baseline data models, communication, extensive materials and publications. We'll be doing a lot of GIS work with the communities as well and, and capacity building in that and also developing, uh, building on from the Live and Learn Ranger program with their software development and we'll be building on from that as well. Thanks, Linda. So these are our research topics. We've got a PhD and a master's. So just to start with the PhD, it's looking at traditional gardening systems and their contribution to biodiversity and climate resilience. So while there's a lot of talk globally around regenerative agriculture and there's now a number of even Hollywood celebrities building this momentum, we think there's significant differences between a Western centric understanding of regenerative ag and how this may be perceived in the Pacific. However, we do see the common understanding is climate mitigation, adaptation, resilience through enhanced management of the soil. Really, the focus is about um, restoring soil and capturing more carbon within soil. We see this as the bridge. However, uh, outside of that, we see significant differences. And we think this is a real chance for the Pacific to start putting down how they see regenerative agriculture as this uh, area builds in momentum and finance. Um, we believe the PhD position will really add value in developing an understanding of these traditional gardening systems as well and how they link to regenerative ag and also contribute to climate resilience. So the master's position is regenerative agritourism standards certification accessibility for indigenous smallholders. Uh, the, it's part of a program that actually originated from an ACR project which just finished. And that project resulted in the establishment of the not-for-profit Regeria Vanua. Regeria Vanua has now developed global standards for Regeria of Agritourism. And we see this master's has a role in evaluating and piloting of this, the pilot of these standards with Indigenous smallholders. So we intend to pilot the standards with the agritourism operators within the case studies of this ACR project. Um, both the master's and PhD position will be working together as we see they're really complementary. Um, also to note, when we talk about accessibility for Indigenous smallholders, uh, we have seen in within a lot of certification uh, platforms, uh, many Indigenous operators, particularly smallholder farmers, are ostracised from actually being able to afford certification and also the complexity of being certified is quite burdensome and difficult. Uh, what we've been doing with the Vanuatu Bureau of Standards is applying global standards to regenerative agritourism to meet the Global Sustainable Tourism Council while also meeting principles of regenerative agriculture that are currently out. Uh, but what we've done is actually bring it to a context specific place based and we're developing methods for farmers to be able to do self-assessment and through the Vanuatu Bureau of Standards it's subsidised so cost is not a, a limit, limiting factor. Anyway, this master's will have a, a definite role in documenting this and uh, hopefully potentially um, supporting this kind of initiative to roll outside of Vanuatu. So I look forward to seeing the exciting research proposals that um, come forward for these two topics. And um, please reach out to me if you need any more information. I'm happy to have a good yarn story and session teller Noah <laughs> um, and talk about this in much more detail. Thanks, Linda. Thank you very much, Sharice. Uh, I'm really, really aware of the time now. Um, I'm hoping everyone is able to stay on uh, for a bit longer because I'm very keen uh, for the Zoom breakout rooms to work. We still have one more presentation, which is from uh, Dr. Simon Quigley from Central Queensland University. It's a livestock project on a farm planning approach to increase productivity and profitability of smallholder cattle systems in Vanuatu. Dr. Quigley. Thanks, Linda. Can you see that? Uh, yes, I can see that perfectly. Cool. Thank you. Uh, g'day, everyone. How are you going? Uh, I'm joining from uh, Rockhampton in central Queensland today. Um, beautiful day up here. Um, it's the beef capital of Australia, for those of you who don't know. So probably the right place to have an ACR project on cattle. Um, You'll see there we've got a very long title to our project, but I much prefer the surprisingly efficient Vijlama version. So locally, our project is known as Business Blong Bullock, and I think that uh, captures what our project in Vanuatu uh, is about. Um, and I should say this is a phase two ACR project. So we have been working in Vanuatu 
uh, since about 2015 with a bit of a break for COVID in between. Uh, we've got a number of partners um, in Vanuatu that we work with, uh, Department of Industry, Department of Livestock and the uh, VARTC, the, the research station up on Santo in the north, um, and a number of Australian partner organisations as well. So just to give some context, I suppose, to the proposed topics that um, uh, would, would potentially be available within the current project, um, the, the photos there on the left uh, reasonably reflect a large number of smallholder cattle farms in Vanuatu, uh, heavily overgrazed, uh, low productivity from the cattle, lots of weeds. Um, and when we talk to the farmers that we work with, they often have a vision for the future of those photos on the right. More productive systems, no weeds, um, and, and cattle in good, good body condition. So they've got this vision, but there's many questions about how to go from where they are now to where they want to be in five years' time. And so that's what our project is really about, how, how to help those farmers build a farm or improve their farm. And when we discuss this with them, we, we appreciate that there's a range of external and internal factors that are involved here. So there's policy, legal factors, there's environment, social obligations, and um, obviously availability to resources. And so the farmers have to take all that information to help them improve their, and be considerate of that when they're improving their farm. And, and we try to explain to them that building a farm is very much like building a pyramid. You need a good solid base and then gradually, incrementally uh, add to that to improve your farm over a period of time. And I believe as they start to build this pyramid and move further up that pyramid, the, the level of sophistication increases, the requirement for inputs is increased costs and increased risks. To give them some idea of what we're talking about here at the bottom, it's basically building capacity. That's the basis for building a good farm and then incrementally increasing, um, I guess, the level of inputs up there and um, uh, to improve their farm and, and getting right up the top, you have things like improving genetics and so on. Many farmers want to start at the top and start with improving their genetics without all these lower levels of that pyramid first. And so we, we ask them what will happen if they start building a pyramid upside down and of course it'll fall over. And so that's a, it's a pretty clear way for us to get a message across that there is probably a better way to think about building a farm or improving a farm. And the approach that we're taking in the current project is business planning and a farm improvement plan. And so I'm just demonstrating this because that's the umbrella under which all these little activities can potentially sit. So using a business planning or farm improvement approach, farm improvement planning approach, to plan activities over a five-year um, window. And you can imagine that a, a smallholder farmer has probably got many, many questions that they want answered. And to us, they're the research questions that our project then addresses through a on-farm participatory approach. We're kind of using a bit of a farmer field school model and these types of things uh, to help them answer those questions, to help them along their journey from preparing their farm improvement plan and then implementing it. I'm a pretty simple sort of character. So we break it down into a few key themes. Feed, cattle need feed, cattle need water. A cattle farm needs management. You need a market for your product and you need the capacity to implement this plan. So the student topics that we've put forward uh, very vague, uh, pretty high level, um, but that's part of the journey for the students, right? To focus in um, within a broad area. So the potential topics that we've put up are around weed control, forage budgeting, a tool for forage budgeting, 
and uh, looking at carbon accounting under some of the grazing systems in Vanuatu. So they all sit under that feed pillar, if you like. Under management, that's animal management, uh, reproduction, puberty, and looking at different breeds that currently exist in Vanuatu and which ones may be more suited to the environment. And I guess that's thinking about the changing climate in, in Vanuatu and a little bit there around on animal technology, which is more specific to traceability of animals in the system um, from a biosecurity point of view and a, a market linkage point of view or market access point of view. And then a range of topics around communication, uh, capacity building. So uh, communication and facilitation. So what methods of communication are most suited to help farmers develop business plans? Um, and another question there around the business case for small business of input suppliers and service suppliers to support farmers implement their um, business plans and farm improvement plans. And thank you, Linda. I'm pretty sure that I was under five minutes. And unfortunately, I have to go in four minutes. Oh, wow. Sorry about that. <laughs> Sorry about that, everyone. Um, we have gone over time. I'm just about to open uh, the Zoom breakout rooms. Uh, thank you so much to all the project leaders who have presented on their really interesting projects today. I'm hoping that people can stay on uh, and speak uh, to, to the project leaders if they're available. I'm going to open the breakout rooms and you are free to select uh, the breakout room that you're interested in. They're all named with the project uh, ACR code and the project leader's name, and you just say, click on the little join button uh, to join that session. I've assigned the project leaders already. So I'll open the breakout rooms now. Can everyone see those? No. No. Yes. I can see them, Linda. Sorry? I can see the rooms. Oh, I'm not sure why you can't select the room that you want to go to. Yes, Linda, I can select as well. Sorry, Dr. Siaka. Bree, are you able to help? Uh, what I can do is start uh, assigning people a room. Um, mm -hmm. Can anyone see the breakout room? box on the bottom of their Zoom screen? No. Oh, oh. dear. Or if you go to more, I might just share. I've, my... I've gone to more, but uh, I'll just share my. I see the breakout from more. Oh, I'm so sorry, everyone. I'm just sharing my. No, that does not work. If people put what they want in the chat, I can start signing oh, you manually. Maybe it's something I can have a look in the background, Bree, while you start doing that. If people could just see which room they want to join, then I will join you into that. Oh. <laughs>
Sorry, everyone. Linda, I can't decipher the codes to go into from if someone says horticulture, can you be no. more specific? Because there are four horticulture rooms. Yes. Thanks, Chris. Simon, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I'm so sorry. Rena, which climate change do you want to join? The first one. So with uh, Doreen. She might not be there. Oh, I mean, I can oh, probably. I've chucked, I've chucked you in there. I hope it works. Yeah. <laughs> no, it hasn't worked. I'm still here. Rena, which room would you like to be in? I've got it now. Oh, okay. Thank you. Rosemary? Oh, Dr. Pilotti is here now. If somebody is in the room here and they want to join a breakout room, could they please let me know? Linda, what's the land care room number? And Mary Johnson. Thank you. Yeah, it's got there more than one horticulture. Okay. It's not... Rosemary, are you after Mary Johnson as well? Hmm, Pranesh. William E. Well, Rosemary, yes. Oh, my goodness. Please bear with us, everyone. We're doing our best. Yeah, so I'm so in. sorry. If you're here in this chat, in this main room, and you want to go out to another room, Please do let us know which one it is. Maria, where do you want to go? Demo Hill. Uh, there we go. I'm Deborah, putting you in you? there. I've put you yeah. in there now. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Derek, can you talk to me directly? Where can I put you? Can I? Can I? Kamal, Debbie, where can I put you? Yes. Please, can people 
speak up. Speak up, don't be shy, we're here to help you. So, so let's go into Carmel's room. Move to social system, which Ditoga, which social system project are you interested in? Giovanni, two, one. Did Togo, which social system, please? Thank you. <laughs> I think Deborah is not in, eh? Maybe oh, sorry. Have... Maybe yeah. she had to go. Yeah, yeah, because oh. we have a student who is interested, I think. Oh, we'll have to just follow up. Yeah, yeah. Atama, oh. where can I put you? Rosemary. Uh, it's oh, okay. Dear. We might just have another meeting together later. Okay, sorry, Mary. Yeah, sorry, this has been. No worries, no worries, Linda. No <laughs> worries. Okay, oh. bye. Thank you. Yeah. Derek, who would you like to talk to? Titalia, which climate change you want to go to? Dr. James, I'm putting you there because... Um, I think... Um, okay, there. this is in Daytona. No. I wish you sorry. Yeah, sorry, what I... did you say? Uh, this is in the Tonga, yeah. Can I move into, I think, um, Dr. Mary Yafan is a local uh, supervisor. Dr. Mary, Mary Yafan, did you say? Mary Yafan. Oh, sorry, I think she's just left the meeting. But she's very happy for students to reach out and catch up with her by email. Okay, that's fine. I can do that. Simon, you're back in the room. Dr. Siaka, yeah, you're back in back, the room. We are back in the room. We are, we are done with. Uh, oh, does, did Simon, Dr. Yeah. Quigley have to leave? Yeah, he had to leave for. Oh, I'm so uh, sorry. An oral examination. Oh, okay. Yeah, but uh, at least we had a uh, few things to discuss. Okay. We had, we had discussed a few things myself for Simon and uh, Dr. Abubakar. And you're happy to follow up later by email, Dr. Siaka? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We agree to follow up for if any 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 issue. Yeah. Okay. I can see that the climate change room and still Dr. Bree, how are you? Dr. Bree. <laughs> Thank you to everyone for staying on longer than the, the meeting was supposed to be. Um, once you get project leaders talking about their projects, <laughs> uh, they can definitely take longer than the allocated five minutes. Is everyone here uh, who is a prospective applicant, do they know which project they're interested in applying to or even which university they're interested in applying to? Everybody's very quiet today. So there's your best day to ask some questions before yes. upcoming sessions. So even if you want to write something in the chat, we can, we can read the chat. Uh, yes, if you have a general question about the scholarship, that's not necessarily about the individual projects. This is an opportunity to ask.
And one thing to keep in mind while you might have a question is that this initial communication is uh, really important in terms of reaching out to prospective uh, supervisors, et cetera. There's a question in the room. Vitoga. Thank you. I have a question regarding uh, the application. Is of it, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Thank you. Can we have like applied for two projects or only one? I had that question the other day. Uh, I think that would be a question best put to the graduate officers uh, at the, in a, the university that you're interested in, Ditoga. Is it FNU or USP that you're interested in? Um, I have one in FNU and oh. one in USP. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> I think that has happened in the past, but that would obviously be something that you'd have to discuss um, with the supervisor. Uh, the potential principal supervisor and the um, ACR core supervisor. And maybe check with um, Mai Alakan, who spoke at the beginning of the session uh, from the ACR country office. Her contact details are on the, the university websites too, and whether that's a possibility. And Does that I help answer you your know. question? All right, thank you. Thank you. Totoga, maybe think about what is of most interest to you, because ultimately, for example, Dr. Pilotti might get seven applicants to her projects looking at uh, coconut. Mm. And from that, she and her team need to make a decision about who they support, which might be only two people. So right. do reach out to the supervisors and the project leaders as soon as you can. And remember that your PhD and master's is something that you need to be really passionate about. Mm. So perhaps one, I understand that two would keep your options open, but one sort of shows that dedication. Okay. Thanks for your question. Thank you for the advice. Yeah. Thank Thanks. you. Yeah, Linda, I'm sorry. I must That's apologize okay. to William. I was in the middle of speaking with him and... Oh, Drop out again. You're um, frozen. That's fine, Dr. Piloti. It's all right. <laughs> Carmel, you're having trouble with your internet? Yes, I'm sorry. I, I don't think I can stay on because it keeps dropping out. Oh, okay. Yeah. I, I was in conversation with Viliama just. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and it took me a long time to get back on. So. Um, perhaps, yeah. Okay. I'm not sure. We're, we don't seem to be in the breakout room anymore. You want me to put you in the breakout room? Uh, well, I'm not sure if, if Viliame is still... Yes, uh, please. That'll be really good. Yes. Thank you, Dr. West. Okay. okay. <laughs> No, we seem to have lost Dr. Pilotti again. Oh, there you are. You're not showing up in the unassigned, Carmel. You're showing up in the in that room. You are here. Does anybody else have a question that they want to ask while we're in this main session? Oh. It 
saying that the breakout rooms will close in in a minute. It's showing that the breakout rooms will close automatically. Um, and perhaps we'll all come back into the room. I'm so sorry, that was really difficult uh, for everyone. Linda, will we post the recording online? Yes, we will. When everybody comes back into the room, I'll, I'll say that we'll put this recording, um, Joe is recording. I will put the recording onto the USP uh, and FNU websites. Um, I think that's everyone back in the room again. I'm sorry about that. The Zoom rooms were very, very difficult. And please accept my apologies for the organization of that. Um, I think thank you to everyone who has stayed on longer uh, than the meeting was scheduled for. I really appreciate that. And if people would like to have um, further sessions with the project leader uh, and potentially a much more uh, individual facilitated conversation, uh, then please do reach out again uh, to the project leader using the email that you find on the university websites in the project list. Um, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank everyone uh, for joining today. And as Bree mentioned, uh, the recording will be on the university websites. Does anybody have a quick question that they want to ask the group um, today? Kamal? No, ma'am. Thank oh, you. I sorry. <laughs> Do any Did I, can I just... Of course. Can I just... Um, mentioned that uh, in the on the FNU website um, there's a slight spelling mistake in oh. Ben's email address oh, okay. so 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 please yeah use Ben McDonald as spelled yeah. um, in the in the header and, and not the <laughs> don't copy the email uh, there's a there's thank a little you. twist thank you um, Uta. Um, I think Pooja is in the room here perhaps she would be able to to fix that for us. If oh, not. yes, if you could fix that, that would be great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Does anybody that. else have a, a question or a comment? Linda, I just wanted to say that uh, we had emails from Sami, Hosja, and uh, Ayaneti Lu with regards to interest in a couple of topics that we had proposed for PhDs. And I, I we couldn't meet them in the breakout, breakout rooms, oh. but uh, welcome to discuss uh, further. At a later stage, maybe we could have separate meetings when Willie is also available. Thank you very much. That's a good idea. Um, sorry. Sorry, Mary. Just very quickly, my oversight. Uh, just a plug for Dr. Shipra Shah, who's on our on with us today. She has a uh, project, ag uh, Agri-Based Ecosystem Services. So anybody interested in that, please contact Shipra. Thank you, Mary. Good plug there. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Shipra. Um, so please, again, accept my apologies for the Zoom breakout rooms. It worked in theory and it worked when we practiced, but it didn't work today. I'm sorry. Um, thank you to everyone for joining. Uh, and obviously, any further questions, please do reach out uh, to either the ACR graduate officer at USP or FNU or to myself or anybody else in the, in the past team. We're all willing to help and reach out to the project leader too and the potential nominated supervisor, either USP or FNU. <clears throat> so thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Have a lovely thank weekend. Thank you. Bye. Bye.